Now, today is April 6th, 2013, and the new millennium is rolling on. Today also, um, Anonymous is, um, oh, they're supposed to be anyway. They were going to be uh, taken taking care of Facebook, but um, recently there's been a few things happened, and um, <clears throat> I've been going through uh, different things in my software. Google, Yahoo, Microsoft are always doing different things and switching software around and partners and non partners. And uh, I have quite a bit of uh, what I do is on Google. I've always appreciated their setup because. I don't really have to install a Microsoft Office every time I go to uh, format my hard drive. Uh, Google has all the tools right there. <clears throat> I used to use iGoogle as my home page too to see the news, check the mail, and all that, but then they decided to shut that down and the other day I was looking at uh, what was it uh, Google Reader yep they shut that down so now I'm having to sort out how to go about some of the things I was doing which uh, now is going to take more time <coughs> But I got different blogs on different sites. And uh, I was reading one blog the other day. It always is on WordPress. A couple of years ago, uh, when I opened up my account on WordPress, uh, there was, I was making tags and search, search search terms and things like that. And one of them I made was for um, living with dignity. And the other day I went to uh, do a search to see if there was any updates on living with dignity on, on WordPress. And uh, the software is pretty good at uh pretty intuitive and said uh, there's no no uh, articles or posts on living with dignity and it suggests and recommended being the first one to post <clears throat> and I was thinking geez I thought there was an organization living with dignity in the U.S., like not dead yet, but um, in Quebec there's uh, Vive la Dignity, Living with Dignity, it's uh, we definitely have one here, <coughs> but I was thinking it'll be good with how spread out disabled people are in different different long-term institutions to have a, have a central location where everybody could be posting and blogging uh, incidents that take place between them and the staff in every department. <clears throat> I was born with arthrogryposis. I've had to live in long-term care since 2000, full-time. Uh, 
I need I need help to get my get up in the morning. Help to go to bed at night. Get my my legs off, stuff like that. Wash up in the morning. <clears throat> get my clothes and boots on. And um I know different different kinds of places have different setups. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I know that I've read plenty of reports through the years when I got connected with different different disability rights networks. <clears throat> People online, different organizations and the bioethics list are I um I've read plenty of stuff, so I know I'm not alone. But it would be good if somebody would have it in them, have enough time and energy to do it, and want to do it to host host a blog and maybe title it that living with dig dignity. Or even call it incident reports. <clears throat> but I was thinking if 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 we left it living with dignity, that way it'd be a little bit uh, help us to post things, but also uh, give solutions or possible solutions. How, how the problems could be fixed once and for all between <clears throat> between inmates and the staffers. I pretty much, you know, consider long-term in institutions that they were, you know, pretty much inmates because there is a a pretty similar attitude for the workers who are not uh, with the same attitude as far as really wanting to, to work there and help people out. <clears throat> there are people who just work in these places as kind of it's just a job, something to pay their bills, and uh, they there's all kinds of problems when people are not not willing to do anything. Or if they, they, they don't want to do it, or they want you to beg like a dog uh, before they'll do something. Things like that happen all the time. <clears throat> but there are decent people who work in these places. And it is really good to uh, to be able to have people to get along with. Not just gang member mentality. So it's kind of like, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of places that people do have friends and uh, but it would be sure good to deal with situations. Now, in my situation, I've been here since 2000. I was here for a year and a half in 1995 96 after um, three respiratory failures. And uh, doctors recommended that I move to Montreal. In the last place, I was renting a farm with a couple of roommates. <clears throat> up north, but they wanted to keep the farm, and I pretty much needed to, to come into Montreal and start start my life. It's the way we'd uh, work for 20 years with an organization that kicked quite a few people out, and then they wanted to and people come crawling back in the door to uh, have a reclassification of. What, what status everybody had 
And I wasn't interested in that. I wanted to do something I could do because I was getting older and I was looking at maybe trying to score work as a freelance writer. Well, that never turned out because uh, the first three years I was on my own <clears throat> with my roommates. I, I, I took my full time just to study to um, become computer literate. And in those days, it was 20, 20 years ago. No, it was 1991. I was 40 years old. And uh, I had to uh, study everything on my own. I couldn't just jump in the car and go down to school. I go down to school every day. In Montreal, I kind of had to go to the bookstores and get whatever books I needed and study you know, at home. There's nobody to answer questions, short, short, uh, short, shortcut things. Uh, because when I get on the phone to tech, technicians to talk to tech support, they were telling me, hey, it, you know, it costs, costs $120 an hour for, for technical assistance. Oh, well, nice. Thanks for, thanks for the info. <laughs> I just kind of studied everything. I had to learn in those days. You had to learn everything. A lot of code. I had to learn a lot of code about patching, updating programs, stuff like that. I had to learn a lot about printers. <clears throat> How to make them uh, print out right on the page, and stuff like that. I had to learn about modems, modem protocols. <clears throat> and by that time I was starting to have respiratory failures and uh, so I was here for a year and a half in 95 96 and got along with the people here really good but I was really uh, pretty tearing the walls down to get out of here and get my own place and have home care workers set up but um, it took a year and a half and when I got my own place it was a pretty nice place and um, I had home care workers but I noticed that home care workers are the same people the same government resources as work in hospitals as PAs or nurse assistants whatever you want to call them <clears throat> And um, after four years, all the all the fighting against the government, the nurses' strike, 1999, and the PAs and, and nurses all getting all bent out of shape, government cutbacks and everything. <clears throat> and I was thinking, well, I'd like to get. I'd like to see a, a thing where the patients can go out and strike with the nurses, you know, like, and uh, really put pressure in the government. But a year later, when I had, when uh, the PA, uh, not the PAs, but the home care workers <clears throat> turned out to be getting worse and worse, less reliable, I had to get up in the mornings. They, they wouldn't come, and I got stuck a few times, and uh, finally, when I had a respiratory failure, uh, there were two or three times in the next few months, or I, I would, I'd be in the hospital, wind up, to, have to go back home, and uh, unreliable, uh, I had one or two good uh, home care workers, but uh, I had some pretty unreliable people, and after four months, I just couldn't keep keep going because I, I couldn't I couldn't recover as fast as I needed to recover in three weeks in the hospital. So the fourth time was in July 2000, 
and after after I uh, landed in the hospital, they put me at, at, from a acute care to a long term ward, and uh, the first the first night I was up there, I was really having a hard time breathing. And I could already stand up. And the PA comes in the room and I ask if I could get help to go to bed at 8.30. And she just stomped her feet on the floor and stuck her chest out, her head up. And it starts telling me stuff like, uh, hey, listen, buddy, you'll go to bed when I feel like it, and not before. I mean, I was really crook. And she didn't give a shit if it's a drop dead. And uh, I was thinking, well, I'm not here to just fucking not drop dead. I'm here to live the rest of my life. And that began to be a pretty rocky road for quite a bit. Uh, the first five years I was here. And I wasn't very nice and but um <clears throat> well, they weren't nice either, you know, like I sure didn't respond the way administration thought I ought to respond. Just take it for the lunch. They just figured I ought to just let people walk all over me and, you know, mouth me off and and I was supposed to sort of like just say, wait till I get a chance to talk to the head nurse or, you know, try to resolve it peacefully. But there's a lot of times in these places people need to understand you can't resolve it peacefully. Because to resolve things peacefully, the person of whatever department that you're trying to communicate with has to be willing to listen and if it's reasonable they should be willing to make a change in how they go about things <clears throat> but that's not how things go a lot of times now, a lot of things have happened in 13 years, and uh, for the most part, things are pretty livable here, but I would sure like to uh, see things be more livable for a lot of people who are living out, uh, in other places. Uh, there are uh, a few other disabled people here, too, and they seem to be doing okay. <clears throat> but one thing I've learned through the years, well, quite a few people have told me that the people who are on trakes and in bed all the time and can't do much, uh, there's, you know, there's, there's really not big conflicts and stuff, but well, when you when you got somebody who uh, who does want to do things and and is more mobile, so well, some of these people that work in these places kind of have a tendency to think they're supposed to be like, like a puppy dog, you know, and it's just kind of like uh, you're just a house pet for. You know, they have to do what they want to do and, and not do what they don't want to do. <clears throat> so, so I, I usually try to get up five in the morning. I check the news, have a, have a, have a drink, and uh, start doing it whether I'm studying or working or something, 
and get as much done as I can until breakfast because sometimes I I can't get much done after after breakfast because I I need to sleep and breathe and digest food <clears throat> and uh, sometimes in night shift they won't get me up at five o'clock and that causes a problem for the days I, I do want to get up. Now, when I have to wear all oxygen, it's kind of, well, I have to wear it because <laughs> my, my lungs aren't doing so good. But every, everybody who knows about oxygen knows that when you have impaired lungs, that, that it also causes a bit of old, uh, carbon dioxide buildup. So, uh, I, for a few years, uh, 2006 to 2010, I was on oxygen 24, 24 7. And then my, I, I had had a, a respiratory failure for, from a, a drug which was to boost my white cells because I was on taking interferon to uh, to deal with my hepatitis C and I contracted that in Mexico in 1987 and when I, I didn't even know I had it until it showed up in a, a blood test and my medical report it was first uh, discovered in 1995, but I'd never, you know, really known about it. <clears throat> Until 2000, so then I wanted to get get rid of hepatitis C, so I did take one round of treatment in 2002. 2003, it was 2003, but I had to uh, stop abruptly because there was, after two months, there was a few heavy situations going on that I had to deal with, <clears throat> but a very shy case, and also my, my common law partner, my wife, was a year full time at long term with cystic fibrosis and uh, she had a lung hemorrhage, a lung hemorrhage and had to get fixed up to, to help her out and uh, so I, I had to cut the treatment, the hep C treatment at that time, it was a really rough time and it turned out I was I I was um, I was clean as a virus when they did a blood test. <clears throat> but the second time was after two thousand six uh when my wife finally died of cystic fibrosis I needed time to hang out to dry and reorganize my life. So I asked the uh, doctor to maybe two or three months and I'd start the treatment. And when I did, <clears throat> after his first first week's uh, blood test, he was a bit shocked at how low my, my white cells or red cells were. So he prescribed me a Nubigen drug to boost my white cells. And that drug knocked out my lung function within two days. So I spent from 2006 to 2010 <clears throat> on oxygen 24-7 and I couldn't do much but fight to breathe. And during that time I also uh, developed a stone in my bladder. So I had a pretty complex situation and the, 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 the PAs 
they didn't give a shit half the, half the time that the things were going on with me. You know, they, they, they didn't really give a shit, you know. And I used to really get out of it. And, uh, but after the hundreds of hours of meetings I've had with head nurses through the years, things have pretty much improved a fair bit compared to what it used to be like between 2000 and 2005. <clears throat> now, those places where disabled people are being admitted to because their parents can't take care of them anymore because their their disabled kids are getting older and bigger physically and it's too much strain for the parents to have to lift them uh lift them around lift and carry them around in and out of you know doors and whatever cars and so they admit them to a nursing home <clears throat> um, and when they get there, uh, because if the workers don't understand too much about people with disabilities, they wind up beating them up and all kinds of shit. So, like, I was thinking it would be good to have a Living with Dignity blog, maybe on WordPress.com. <clears throat> and if anybody was uh, wanting to take care of that, at least it would be there and people could uh, know about it and post any incidents on there. Now that wouldn't just, um, that wouldn't really be like the, the big solution or anything. See, aside from uh, posting incidents uh, so that we all know what's going on in uh, different long-term care uh, facilities, it's really important to talk to the head nurses. I got to do that regularly. And since I have, things have smoothed out a fair bit. Now, <clears throat> one thing that really, really blows my mind is in this place, uh, the hospital turns the the kitchen over to a private company and every year the company changes managers. Now the manager they put in here uh, last year, you know, she was pretty nice until about a month ago. And <clears throat> all of a sudden I get all this started getting brown sugar on my trays instead of raw sugar because I've always been uh, specific to uh, you know I used to eat a pretty healthy diet before I wound up in a situation I mean happened to move into long term I understood that uh, they would not be uh, letting people eat on you know, macrobiotic diets but I, I always try to stay away from white sugar white flour products and uh, things like that and but the kitchen manager she, she, she changed contracts with, regarding the sugar and uh, <clears throat> I asked her about it and uh, she said, well, that's the way it's going to be. I said, well, what about raw sugar? Is for one thing, I don't want to be putting all that bleach into my blood. I've already got, my liver's already uh, doing enough to, to work, and I don't need that stuff in, in my blood. And she, she just kind of like, no way. She wouldn't bend an inch. And it turned out a few days later, or a week later, that there was raw sugars mixed in with the brown sugars. And so then I asked her <clears throat> to maybe separate 
the brown sugars from the raw sugars. She absolutely refused. And I thought, well, this is getting out of hand. You know, it's like, for one thing, the hospital takes uh, our checks to cover the food and the cost of staying here in the long term. And on top of that, because they, they only cover, uh, they only uh, get basics of food, um, there are things I have to buy it out of what's left of my check. And, but I'm at the point where I can't take anything more out of my check because I'd have to cut my internet bill and I'd have to cut my phone bill. And there are people who need to be able to get a hold of me uh, on the phone. And I'm sure not going to be bound to the, the landline extension number when I'm not not in the room. <clears throat> but I do have a, a real special friend. My best friend is in Australia. And we do stay in touch. So I need a phone. I need uh, I need an internet connection. And I fork out 80 bucks a month for for my high speed internet account, so I don't get chopped uh, for going over my my bandwidth usage limit. So I've got unlimited bandwidth. <coughs> And uh, I do more a lot, a lot more stuff than the average person, with uh, when I'm online. So, so to to have to have a mousy little bitch making my life miserable, saying, "Okay, we got you know." Basically, she's she sees that that there is raw sugar, there is brown sugar and most people don't care what they eat so that's why they're sick all the time and uh, because it's a food processing industry <laughs> and I, I don't, I'm the only healthy per I'm probably the healthiest person here because I don't I don't put all that stuff in my blood <clears throat> so um, that's it it really uh, irritates me to have somebody who is in charge of authority in some department and they're not they're not civilized that to me is not civilized so that's the kind of things that bother me and I not every time you send a, a brown sugar in my tray I just send it back down to the kitchen, you know. So it's kind of like, but it, on the other hand, I I do have uh, two or three friends, and uh, when they're uh, working down there, they make sure I get my raw sugar. That's that's being civilized. So I don't like being mad. I don't like. Uh, really making people's life miserable and it would be good if everybody is just really willing to get along nobody has to sh and nobody has to prove anything to anybody and I'm sure not gonna let people prove anything to me you know when I make a mistake I don't mind apologizing but <clears throat> I'm not going to just let people walk all over me and uh, think think they're going to get away with it. It just doesn't work that way. Now, I can't you know, people go rub my nose in it, how much I need your help. And uh, I don't care. They're being paid to do their job. That was one of the problems of the first five years I was here. They used to uh, go around the rooms, kind of some of these 
uh, is some of the people were that were working here. They used to go around the rooms and just tell people, "I'm not paid for this. I'm not paid for that." I mean, really arrogant, you know, like. <clears throat> So, see this? Oh, I gotta get, I gotta get it right. <clears throat> uh, we're gotta get here. Oh, oh my! There. Now you got it. Ironside is a world headquarters. Very special friend of mine. Ah. A real special friend sent it. Sent it in the mail. It freaked me out. <laughs> Get this package. There are three t shirts in it. Now, Ironside's world headquarters. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, things are, things are kind of hunky dory. But, <clears throat> I would really like to see if, if there are enough disabled people in situations in different locations around the U.S., Canada, the U.K., where it, they would be interested in writing down any incidents at this on uh in one blog so that everybody could read it. And if you notice, you know, if if there was a blog that, that was uh for all these um incident reports, it would the Disability rights organizations could help use that information and for the governments to deal with to find solutions because <clears throat> the two things are involved attitude. It's it really is an issue of one thing attitudes. And number two, communication skills. You know, it's kind of like I know people that work in these places have some of them. Some of them do work hard. Some of them do work hard, and they're overworked because of the people who don't work hard. And they just either more for themselves and their money. But there are people who are really good people, and it really is like uh, good to see some people when they're on shift. It really is. It's kind of like you know, for people to have to live here, it makes them, makes them feel good, knowing it's uh, one of their friends is here. Uh, that's about all I gotta say, but. Uh, if anybody does watch this, this new it, and sorry it's so long, but I don't do videos very often. <clears throat> I'm all spaced out. But, um, yeah, don't forget, my resides world headquarters. <clears throat> Okay, take care. Bye-bye.